Hi everyone, here we're going to start covering the nervous system. Specifically in this PowerPoint, we're going to be talking about the functions of the nervous system. And just to talk a little bit in general, we can say that the nervous system is actually among the smallest of the organ systems in terms of body weight, yet it is by far the most complex of the systems. And although it is often compared to a computer, the nervous system is much more complicated and versatile than any electronic device, as you might expect. Yet, as in a computer, in the nervous system as well, there is this rapid flow of information and high processing speed that depends on electrical activity. And unlike a computer, Portions of the brain can rework their electrical connections as new information arrives, and that's part of the learning process. So the more that you try to learn information, the better the connections are between the cells in your brain. This means that as you're studying for this class, your neurons are making and creating new connections. In addition, if we want to talk about the mass of an adult brain, since we said that it's the smallest organ system, we can say that an adult brain is going to weigh between 2.8 pounds and 3.1 pounds. And a newborn human brain is about 0.77 to 0.88 pounds. We can also compare the difference between male brains and female brains where male brain weighs on average 3 pounds and female brain weighs on average 2.8 pounds. Therefore, on average, the female brain is smaller than the male brain. Does this mean that men are smarter than women? Oh, definitely not, right? What makes you smart are the connections between the cells in your brain and also the connections between the right and left hemisphere that is done through the corpus callosum. So this is what will determine how smart you are. In fact, Albert Einstein's brain weighed 2.7 pounds, so less than a female brain on average. And of course, he was really smart. But when they dissected his brain, they saw that he had a really big corpus callosum. So his connection between the right and left hemispheres were greater than average. Even though the nervous system is this very highly organized network, it only contains two major types of cells. Isn't that amazing? It contains the neurons and the neuroglias. Neurons can also be called nerve cells. Neuroglias can also be called glial cells. It does contain billions of neurons, but we have even more neuroglias, and we will talk about these cells in more details in the upcoming slides. We can actually divide the nervous tissue into two subdivisions. We have what we call the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is going to be comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system will be comprised of the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves, which are the nerves that exit the spinal cord, as we can see here on this image. So everything that's down the midline will be part of the central nervous system. And that's, again, only the brain and the spinal cord. Everything else will belong to the peripheral nervous system. Here on this module, we're just going to do an overview of the different types of cells. We'll start here with the neurons or the nerve cells, and they possess this electrical excitability, which is basically the ability to respond to a stimulus and convert that stimulus into a nerve impulse. What is a stimulus? A stimulus is going to be any change in the environment that is going to be strong enough to initiate a nerve impulse. And very simply put, a nerve impulse is also called an action potential and it is going to be this electrical signal that will propagate or travel along the surface of the membrane of a neuron. It begins and it travels due to the movement of the ions 
mainly sodium and potassium, between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And there are going to be specific channels that will allow the movement of these ions. And we will talk more about this later on. Now, these nerve impulses, they travel really fast and they can range from about 0.5 to 130 meters per second. Now, some of these neurons, they can be very tiny and they will propagate the impulse, as you can imagine, over a short distance. But some of them are going to be the longest cells in your body. Motor neurons that cause the muscles to wiggle your toes, for example, they're going to extend from the lumbar region of your spinal cord, which is just above the waist level, all the way down to your foot. And some sensory neurons are even longer. Those that will allow you to feel sensation in your toes, they will stretch all the way up from your foot to the lower portion of your brain. Neurons are cells that do not undergo mitotic division after they become differentiated, so they lose that ability to divide. And this is why when you suffer a brain injury, it's very hard for you to regain all your function back. Neuroglias or glia or glial cells, they're going to constitute about half of the volume of the central nervous system. Their names actually derive from the idea of early histologists that they were the glue that held the nervous system together. So that's why they're called neuroglia. We now know that the neuroglia, they're not merely these passive bystanders, but they're rather active participants in the nervous tissue function. And generally, the neuroglia, they're going to be smaller than the neurons. And as stated previously, they're very much more numerous than the neurons. In contrast to neurons, the glia, they do not generate or propagate the nerve impulse, and they have the ability to multiply and divide in the mature nervous system. In cases of injuries or disease, the neuroglia, they will multiply to fill the spaces that was formerly occupied by the neurons. And also in brain tumors that are derived from glial cells that are called gliomas, they are going to tend to be highly malignant because of this rapidly growing, multiplying glial cells. We do have six different types of neuroglias. Four of them are going to be located in the central nervous system, and these are the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, the microglia, and the ependymal cells. And two of them are going to be located in the peripheral nervous system, and these are the Schwann cells and the satellite cells. We will cover these cells in more details in another learning outcome, but in general, the main function of the neuroglias are to support, nourish, and protect the neurons. So basically, they're just going to assist the neurons so that the neurons can perform what they need to perform, which is send the electrical impulses to the entire body. With regards to the different functions of the nervous system, we have five listed here. With regards to the first one, which is maintaining homeostasis, we do have trillions of cells in the human body that do not function independently of each other, but they must work together to maintain homeostasis. For example, your heart cells, they must contract at a rate that will ensure this adequate delivery of blood to all tissues of the body. And the nervous system can either stimulate or inhibit these activities to help maintain homeostasis. So for example, if you're doing extra exercise, then you need more oxygen. So this stimulus will come from the central nervous system for your heart to beat faster, to be able to supply your blood with more oxygen. So that will be one of the functions of the nervous system. Next, we have the receiving sensory input. And this just means that the sensory receptors, they will monitor numerous external and internal stimuli. As we are aware of sensations from some stimuli, such as vision, hearing, taste, smell, touch, pain, body position, which we talked about already, temperature, and other stimulus such as blood pressure, blood gases, and blood pH, and all of these are going to be processed at an unconscious level, meaning that you're not aware of these stimuli. 
In other words, that you don't have to think about them for them to happen. Next, we have the integrating information. So the brain and the spinal cord, which are part of the central nervous system, they're going to be the major organs that are going to be processing the sensory input and initiating a response for this information that's arriving at the central nervous system. The input may produce an immediate response and also it can be stored as a memory or it can be ignored. And we will talk about how this integration will occur later on. Next, we have the controlling of muscles and glands. We know that skeletal muscles, they normally contract only when stimulated by the nervous system. Therefore, the nervous system will control the major movements of the body by controlling the skeletal muscle. Some smooth muscles, such as that in the walls of the blood vessels, for example, they contract only when stimulated by the nervous system or by hormones. In cardiac muscles and some smooth muscles, such as that in the wall of the stomach, they contract autorhythmically. Remember we talked about? That means that there's no external stimulation that is needed for each contraction to occur. And although the nervous system does not initiate contraction in these smooth muscles and the cardiac muscle, it can cause the contractions to occur more rapidly or more slowly, depending on the situation. And finally, the nervous system does control also the secretion from many glands, including the exocrine glands, such as the sweat glands, salivary glands, and the glands of the digestive system, as well as some of the endocrine glands. So I don't know if you notice, but sometimes if you're very nervous, then you start to sweat a lot. And those are influences of the nervous system. And lastly, we have the establishment and the maintenance of the mental activity. And the brain is going to be the center of the mental activities, including the consciousness, the thinking, the memory, and the emotions. And we will talk about all of that when we get to the brain specifically.